thank you all for attending. This is going to be the best of the breakout session, so you've made a, a wise choice. Uh, this year, we, we had an unprecedented healthcare crisis. We had the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. But in some ways, the most amazing changes are the ones we're going to be talking about here, which was the remarkable acceleration of uh, technological adoption and digitalization that happened as a result of the other two crises. Um, and we've got a great panel to talk about it. What we hope to do here in the next 45 minutes or so is provide some very clear takeaways about how work is changing, how tech's role is changing, and how leadership and strategy are going to be changed as a result. Uh, the session is presented by GenPact. Thank you, GenPact, for that. Uh, and we have a great panel. Uh, Sanjay uh, Srivastava, who is the Chief Digital Officer at GenPact. Bonnie Simi, who is the president of JetBlue Technology Ventures, Jeff Majinkalda, uh, CEO of Coursera, and Sigal Zarmi, who is the international CIO at Morgan Stanley. A couple of things before we get started. Today's conversation is on the record. Uh, we'll be taking your questions and comments. Use the chat, please. I'll be monitoring the chat uh, if you put a question in there, I'm likely to call on you. I will ask you to share your audio and your camera to ask your question. And I urge you to uh, participate. We really want this to be a, a, a dialogue. Uh, but to get us started, I want to ask the panelists each to identify the three biggest or most surprising changes that they see in how tech is being used in companies. Uh, and, and I ask you each to, to try and keep your answers to uh, three or four minutes so we have plenty of time uh, for discussion. And Sanjay, uh, I'll pick on you and make you go first. Great. Well, first off, thank you for having us here. And uh, I think you teed up really well. Look, it's a really exciting time for those of us that are in digital because what we're seeing is truly unprecedented and the acceleration is amazing. But I'll tell you one thing that I, that I think is fundamentally different from the other times we've done digital transformation, and that is the fact that for the first time, this is not digital transformation. It's about business transformation that happens to be enabled by digital. And I, and I think that's the lens we take, and that's really driving the acceleration, the absorption, the deployment of these technologies. Um, look to your question about sort of three big things that we see in the industry and we're focused on. Um, I'll call them out. I think the first one is we're really entering the final lap in the race to automation. So we think about intelligent automation. It's a journey we've been on for many years now, and we've been edging forward surely but steadily. But I think we've reached a point where now we're in the final lap. Um, clouds have been here for a few years. Uh, we've had the economic advantage. We've had the distributed um, compute, high compute server capabilities. But I think what's new is that the business need is driving a real appetite for a technology that allows you to innovate fast, that allows you to bring new capabilities to deliver new functionality for what's required in the new normal. And it just turns out that the cloud from a time to market, being able to build these new capabilities is about the fastest we can get there. And so it's seeing a massive take up. And it's because the innovation around those ecosystems are giving us these building blocks, we call it composable services, and the ability to sort of put them into, uh, into, a, into a puzzle, to mix them, to mix and match and assemble them, and bring you new capability is something that's really different. Of course, the other piece of that is AI is now truly in the enterprise usable. So we've gotten to the point where, you know, language extraction is human, translation is at human capability levels. And data is actually above human capabilities. And so now you combine the cloud, the composable services, and then the final frontier of AI, and you pull them together in intelligent automation, we believe is, um, is, is in its final lap. So, you know, within the company, we're focusing on making pretty much a lot of things we do completely touchless, right? Um, the second area that we think is important to sort of focus on is the idea of data and analytics now becoming core to enterprises. Now, look, data has always been available. It used to be that it was the byproduct, it was the collateral sort of byproduct of automation. We had it, we kept it, we did things with it. I think that's changed. I think we're now going to a world where data is a first-class citizen, that it has a first-class citizenship right. And we think about building a foundation of data that's very different from keeping the data around as you might need it later. And that involves a significant amount of sort of technology around stacking it and building it and curating it and normalizing it and making it consumption ready. Um, 
were also learned from the pandemic that no enterprise is an island. And so the idea of being connected, harvesting the data sit across the ecosystem becomes so important. And so building a foundation of data, harvesting the connected ecosystem, and then of, of course applying machine learning, AI capabilities, neural nets, to solving for problems, finding those weak links, being able to find insights and large batches of data that allow us to make better decisions. We think the face of data analytics is completely changed. And so we're investing significantly in this area in building out uh, capability within the company on the, on the data that we touch and being able to drive business benefits at a completely different record level. So that's number two. I think the third big thing, and we spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, and we love the interaction with the audience here as well, is the whole bit about the future of work. Look, work as we know it has changed. It's changed in the new normal post pandemic because it's distributed, it's dispersed. We have to find new ways of kind of of kind of really bringing in the creative energy of us working together in physical environments and replicate that in this virtual environment and how we orchestrate work, how we actually get work done in this new normal is different from the way we used to do it. The blueprint changes and thus the orchestration capabilities need to change. And so we think the future work changes in that dimension. We think it changes in the dimension of experience because we're finding experience is the number one driver. It's the true north of any compass we use to drive digital transformation. And if we can center on that, we invariably get to the right results. And then finally, the notion of the human in the loop, this, this, this sort of imaginary boundary, this hypothetical, hypothetical frontier that we have between man and machine, that's evolving, that's changing, it'll continue to change. And as we go through that change, how do we think about the role of the human? How do we think about skilling, cross-skilling, the skill sets we'll need? You know, we've landed on a term inside the company we call bilingual. It's the ability to be a financial analyst and a machine learning technician at the same time. It's the ability to be a supply chain professional and uh, analytics um, neural net modeler at the same time. And we think more and more that cross-skilling, the ability to, to speak two languages at the same time is what the world needs. And so we've been on a journey of transforming ourselves, of building those skill sets. And all of that is in the world of future, in the in the future of the world, uh, work. Yeah. So, so, you know, at Genpack, we focus on those three things and we see that across the industry. I want to come back to a number of those and I'm sure we will come back to skilling. We will come back to skilling with Jeff here, but the one thing I want to ask you before we move on, Sanjay, that the first one you mentioned, basically the acceleration, the remarkable speed of change we've seen in the last eight or nine months, you seem to be saying that's going to continue. Yes, I think uh, I think what's different this time around is that businesses are fundamentally changing to evolve and deliver new capability, new growth, new functionality in the post-pandemic scenarios. And I think um, that's a real opportunity. I also think there's some challenges, right? I think this isn't about taking one piece of the business and digitizing it. This is about taking it into the core. And so what we're finding it is most of us need three muscles. We need the muscle of digital capabilities, which we'll talk about here. But we also need the muscle of understanding the domain, the process, the nuances, of the industry, because you still have to model those workflows. You still have to configure those business rules. You still have to label the data for AI. You still have to draw insights from, from those weak links that machine learning will give us now. And, and so I think domain becomes very important. And I think the third thing that becomes important, and this is very different this time around, is you've got four assets in, a, in an enterprise. You have people, you have process, you have technology or digital, and you have data. And it's about the simultaneous orchestration of all four of those levers. You can't attack it at one bit at a time. You have to think about all four of those things to drive the adoption, to drive the business change, to drive the user um, engagement that we need to get there. And so we think this is different, this is the new normal, and this is the path we'll stay on. Yeah, that's very helpful, Sanjay, thank you. Let me, let me turn to Bonnie and get the perspective from an industry that's been clobbered by the uh, last nine months. You've got all the technology changes, but in the meantime, your business disappeared. Yeah, so it's uh, it's been, I tell you, our current reality in the pandemic is creating fundamental shifts in strategy. Now, obviously, coming from JetBlue Airways, you can just imagine how the travel industry strategy is evolving. And, and most of the, the evolutions actually are, are tech enabled. And we have to be ambidextrous. On one hand, we, ha we have a core business that we have to run, uh, uh, flying people from point A to point B, but that business is, sh is shrinking right now. So how do we get more customers back in a safe way? How do we ensure their safety of our, of our crew members? Um, and then how do we expand our reach into other areas? I believe that it is in times like this, 
the, where innovative companies can really lean in, you can find those fundamental strategy shifts. Now, for us, I kind of in the, the three th lenses that we're, be, we're looking at here uh, is really through the customer lens, the workplace, and the workforce or the employees. So if we think about, you know, the customer and, and we actually prior to uh, the pandemic, we had done a full innovation sprint around uh, contactless travel. Uh, and we already had things teed up for this. And when I talk about contactless service, because the entire world now, we're in a no contact world. So we're moving to uh, full digitization as much as possible, digitization of customer service and, uh, and a much faster adoption by customers. So that is leading to a cashless society, leading to payment innovation, uh, uh, online shopping, dining, pickup and delivery. What that means though now, when you go to these online platforms, how are you served up recommendations for things to, to buy? Where, how are you served up the types of, of, of virtual meetings or virtual conferences, even what we're doing now? So the adoption of AI is becoming more and more important. And digital identities, with, you know, we're seeing acceleration in facial recognition, biometrics. And we're seeing this in everyday changes, even for those for those who are driving to work. Uh, you can think of, you know, toll booths. They're all cashless now. Do they think that'll ever come back? That they'll be accepting cash? No. <laughs> um, when you go and pick up your coffee, you order in advance, and you know, companies had the apps for these online ordering, but there wasn't as much customer adoption. Now it's fundamental. You must. Uh, and so, how do we remove lines? When you think of travel, you often think of lines. How, uh, thinking through removing that because we don't people don't want to be in lines or around others now. And then you know a whole other area which is getting into the workplace is telehealth. So these are things that are here to stay and are very much enabled um, by technology. So that's the first one is how are your customer needs changing? The next one is the is the workplace and and uh, you know the the for those who are in the office whether it's office work or conferences like this, or even frontline workers, it's, we've all had to make complete fundamental changes in how we work. And, you know, remote working used to be, used to be only for ex the exception, but it's not the exception anymore. We all are, which is changing how companies actually work. And I think the, the older school leadership, if you will, was saying, well, you have to have FaceTime, you have to be in the office. And now we realize, you know, business is happening just fine without being in the office. So that then is, is shrinking the workplace locations, the smaller offices, or even no office. It puts much more emphasis on remote collaboration tools, you know, obviously video conferencing, communication tools, uh, and adoption of those. So people who, who, I mean, I serve on public boards. And when you, we always had to meet in person. And if we did do a conference call, it was a call. Now it's all video. So things, people have adopted that. That also leads into those who do need to be in the workplace, obviously in travel. Uh, you can't fly an airplane remotely. Uh, you can, so we have to have workplace safety. And we think about things like uh, evolving the testing and online uh, uh, on-site health or even health passports. We see it evolution uh, might move into that, that space. So that's kind of the workplace. And then the last place I'm thinking about is the employee. And I, you know, I think Sanjay mentioned this, this earlier. I think we have to, you know, if we aren't careful, the digital divide will get even bigger. Um, so given these traumatic changes in the workplace needs, the, the customer needs, now we have to think about our workforce and how we train them. It's not in person training anymore. It's moving, a lot of it is moving online. And how do we upskill them? It's the full digitization of learning, just in time learning, mobile learning, virtual reality tools. And, and these, are, these are here to say, um, and now they went from nice to have to must have. And now that your workforce is, is often um, remote, it is a way if the workplace provides the learning, the, um, it gives more loyalty to stay. Um, so you can keep that that lower skilled employee and move them up the next level to the next level to the next level. And I know that tees up great into this <laughs> of our other speakers today. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I think she uh, sort of uh, handed it over to you on a pedestal. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Alan. You know, Bonnie and Sanjay have both, I think, uh, laid out some really important trends. Maybe what I'll do is sort of think about it in terms of how we, of course, are approach strategy and, and literally how is strategy changing because of digital. When we think about strategy, we usually think of customer. Mm -hmm. yep. you know, who's the customer? What's their problem? How are you solving their problem? We think about opportunity. What market are you going after? How big is it? How fast is it growing? 
and what are the unique economics of serving that market? And then the third is advantage, which is how can you do something that's sustainably different that matters to your customer so your competitors don't steal your customers? Across the board, and three, all three dimensions of strategy, uh, digital and technology is just changing everything. Just in an effort to make it clear how comprehensive this is, in terms of customer, digital is changing the experiences that your customers expect. They expect it to be digital, personalized, on demand, uh, convenient, affordable. It changes the way you market and sell to customers. You know, customers are online. How do you find them? How do you sell to them? How do you nurture uh, prospects and turn them into sales? It changes the way you serve your customers. You know, once you have that relationship, the way that you have ongoing relationships with customers is totally different in a digital world. And then finally, and this is a little bit meta, the speed and the cost with which you can create new offerings that could be designed, validated, and deployed is just radically faster than anything we've seen before. Because of what Sanjay talked about, these sort of on-demand uh, sort of cloud services where you don't have to build everything. It doesn't take a lot of time and money and capital to put new offerings into the market. So that's totally changing that whole product market fit with customers. On the opportunity side, technology is opening up new accessible markets because people are connected with devices and they're all part of networks. And it's not just that they're connected, new ideas and innovations can proliferate, propagate through networks so much faster than they ever could before. So a winning idea often exhibits a winner take all market. And if you don't get there quickly, you might be basically blocked out by a competitor. And then the final piece on advantage, you know, people used to talk a lot about property plants and equipment, huge capital investments, intellectual property, there's definitely some of that, but now data, network effects, and customer relationships are kind of the new building blocks of, um, of sustainable advantage. So what this kind of means is that business are really having to transform every element of their business. Uh, the World Economic Forum just put out a future of jobs report 2020, just a few weeks ago. 84% of companies said that COVID is causing them to accelerate the digitization of their businesses. 95% of them said that they're going to have to fundamentally retrain their workers in order to stay competitive. And so, of course, as you might expect, Coursera has seen tailwinds in, in every uh, element of our business, especially around data, data science, cloud computing, AI, and agile business practices. Yeah, I want to come back to that, but let's go to Seagal first. Uh, uh, a different industry, but I suspect you're seeing some of the same, uh, same headwinds. Yeah, we do, and, and we do have activities and initiatives around cloud and data and AI, ML and information like uh, Sanjay and Bonnie and Jeff mentioned. Uh, what what I, I think the COVID has shown us is how technology can help us connect better to our values during this pandemic. And I think um, our, our values of a company are really coming to a test during a crisis. And this has been uh, economic, health, and, and social crisis. And we have seen how technology can help bring those values to life. If it is around how do we give back um, during this time, give, giving back is, is a big piece of Morgan Stanley values. And how do you do that when uh, you cannot really go physically to either schools or um, um, you know uh, soup kitchens, and how do you still give back through technology by uh, participating in upskilling um, uh, different uh, part of the uh, of um, the economy and so on? Um, the other thing that we have seen um, is how technology help us connect better with our customers, which is another big. Um, um, one of our values and how do we make sure that we uh, continue the conversations with customers, developing new products for customers, helping customers be successful. We've had the most um, high volume trading days uh, in, in March and we were able to support our customers during uh, that volatility because of our commitment to customers and the technology that is behind it that we are invested in. So that's one of the things that I think technology is helping with, really connecting um, 
to, to the values and, and taking care of, of our employees, especially during this time. The other thing that I will mention is our focus on resiliency. Um, I, I think when, when we think about resiliency, usually in technology, we think about resiliency of the infrastructure. Can we all work remotely with no problems? Can we connect? Can we collaborate? And, uh, and we're thinking about re, uh, resiliency in a broader sense. So not just resiliency of our technology, but also the resiliency of our, our data. Do we know where the data is and what do people do with it? Um, resiliency of our people, and that means do we give them the right tools so they can do their job in the most efficient way, not to add more stress on an already very stressful environment for everybody working from home with kids and health issues and so on. And then also resiliency of our processes. And that goes to what Sanjay talked about um, in automation and AIML, because you know our processes before, some of them relied on people being in the office, sitting one next to each other, mm -hmm. and being able to overlook and oversee and approve things that others are doing. And now when you're all remotely and everybody's by themselves, how do you make those processes resilient in a way that you are not dependent on being in an office and you're still able to support your customers? So I, I would say those are the two that have, um, I wanted to add to everybody else's great comments. That's great. You, you, you uh, the four of you put a lot on the table. I want to open it up, open up the conversation here in just a minute. I know Mike Lowry has a question and Mike, if you want to go ahead and uh, 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 share your, sound in your video, but Seagal, while Mike is doing that, let me ask you a quick follow-up question. Uh, you, you talk about how the crisis has been an opportunity to connect back to your values. I have to say, if I go back to March, it wasn't obvious to me that that would happen. You have an economic crisis like this, it hits everybody's bottom line, there's a lot of focus on short-term results. Uh, why has this crisis caused I, I agree with you. I perceive the same thing, but it's not clear to me why the crisis has caused the connection to value. I, I think the value create the culture, and if people realize the values of the organization, that's what makes the culture going. And when everybody's working remotely, it's hard to really keep the culture going. So that's what you kind of fall back on. Uh, we've hired a lot of people during the last. Uh, nine months and how do you bring people on board and get them acclimated and integrated and engaged if it's not to have a common mechanism around your culture and that goes back to the values and and the company that has strong values that people really believe in it and the leaders are actually behaving based on those values will may and, and I, I truly believe technology can help you strengthen those values and exhibit it especially in a remote work environment uh sanjay i see you and jeff uh, i see you both nodding you want to add to that i uh, i agree with what sigal just said i think i i think that one of the things the pandemic has done is as we've shifted from an in-presence contact world where we picked up values from the ecosystem through experience, through interaction, through engagement, and the creative energy that comes around that, and we moved into this remote work from home environment, I think there's been a real need, and I think everyone's responded really well to this, to actually pull that together into a purpose and put that out in a way that people can still absorb it, that employees can still get that core value proposition Without having, without having to meet in person and observe it, if you will. And I just think that that's the reason to your question of why things have changed this much um, there. I do wanna add one other thing to what Jeff said, uh, and Jeff, you'll go next after me, so you tell me if you agree or disagree. I think there's a few things that have fundamentally changed in the world of skilling and reskilling, at least for employees. Um, I think the first one is, and I've got high schoolers, so they're going through this online learning experience in high school, and it's been, just, uh, it's been, uh, it's been uh, both frustrating and amazing to watch. But one of the key things I think we've learned is that, you know, learning now doesn't have to assume that knowledge is not immediately available. In other words, most of our secondary education is based on the fundamental tenet that knowledge is not immediately available and you have to learn all this stuff. And then and then we find kids that are so disinterested because they can get that information off of YouTube faster than they can get it from a book. 
I think what we're doing with rescaling and learning now is that we're making all, we're starting with the assumption that knowledge is immediately available. And so we build these micro capsules of knowledge training events that can be dynamically accessed at the point of need, anytime in the day, anywhere from the world, right? And that's fundamentally changing how we think about rescaling. It isn't the large courses. It isn't everything laid out in lectures. It's about experiential learning. It's about coming back from having solved a tough problem, let's say with data and analytics and figuring out a random force analysis and taping a quick five minute sort of, here's how I went about it, here's the problem. And then with search, with availability, with dynamic sort of access, you know, we're changing the game completely. And I think that's been one of the big shifts that happened in the whole world of learning that has made this so much more realistic, okay. so much feasible for where we are. And I yeah. promise you we'll come back to that, but quickly, Jeff or Bonnie, uh, any observations on the values point? Well, yeah, for us, I think on the values, it, we, I was uh, I was one of those non-believers. I was a big, you know, you got to come into the office. That's where creativity and collaboration happens. I, I was forced into this. And I've, I've personally been stunned at how productive the team has been. And and the way that we have meetings is very different. We, we've we created new norms about the way you do Zoom. And it's not just the video. It's the video, usually a share screen where someone's basically pacing the conversation. There's a chat window where there's threads of Q&A happening. And then we usually share the link, which is a Google Doc. And people are actually doing context-specific commenting on the presentation they're saying. So seeing. So it is just a very dynamic way of yeah. working that in many respects has brought people together. Now, there's definitely a social connectivity piece that's missing. People feel a little bit, but definitely more burned out, definitely more isolated and alone. They miss the fun of socializing. I think the workplace is going to be where you celebrate and socialize. Actually, I think a lot of creativity works are going to get done online. But what we've done is we've kind of transformed this. We've decided that uh, we're going from a world at Coursera where fewer than 5% of our positions were remote to one where we think probably about 40%. In the next three years, 40% will be entirely remote. And then probably another 50% will be come into the office whenever you want. But we're basically embracing the world where anyone can learn anything at any time from anywhere. And many, many, many digital jobs will be available to anyone anywhere. And it's going to be an incredible leap forward in access to knowledge and also access to economic opportunity. So we, we're pretty pretty thrilled and excited about what the future might hold. I'd love to add the piece about values because you know in, in our industry, yes, there are some that are working remotely, but most of our workforce, we have 23,000 uh, employees and uh, 20,000 of them or 21,000 of them work out in the front line. And so it isn't remote for them that like you can't, you know, you have to be in the field. And so uh, we have we have the values embedded in what we do all the time. And so I think that values are not just uh, reinforced while you're sitting next to somebody in the office. Values are reinforced through everything that you do, how you communicate as leaders, how often you're uh, you're in the workforce. And for us, we've always done leadership, what we call in pocket sessions or town halls, if you will, where we'd be out in the field. Now, of course, those we are doing remotely, but we find that they reach more people. So values are embedded in everything that you do, and they can be reinforced even more now virtually. And Bonnie, yeah. I'll, just, I'll just add on to that. As, as, as businesses go more global, more remote, more distributed, what holds you together has to be more along the dimensions of of meaning. Why are you together? What does it yeah. mean to be at this company? How do we treat each other, whether it's digital or, or, or in, in person? We think that the glue that holds an organization together through values and through processes and through uh, through good leadership will be more important than ever. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Mike, sorry to leave you sitting there for so long. Go ahead, ask your question, please. Oh, well, no problem. It's uh, the values discussion is an interesting segue into what I wanted to talk about, and that is the use or misuse of the technology to more ever invasively use our personal data and invade our privacy. Uh, and I see just examples abounding of that misuse, uh, ranging all the way from simple shopping on Amazon to uh, behavior modification videos on TikTok, and so on. And uh, Americans seem to have always reacted slowly, and then when they finally wake up, ferociously. 
And I would foresee at some point a very strong reaction in a reverse direction to the use of these technologies. I'd like to get their comments uh, of the panel for, on that. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Let's get comments while we're doing that. Uh, Yidner Salazar has a question. So Yidner, if you'll uh, share your uh, audio and video, we'll get you up here and, and uh, you can go next. Who wants to take on uh, Mike's privacy question first? I'll take I'll take Maybe a brief, brief first stab. One is we think about non-market forces to protect privacy. We also think about market forces. I don't think that we can only rely on market forces to take care of this. But when you look at GDPR yeah. and, the, and the premium that consumers put on personalization and convenience, I mean, honestly, we should not expect the disclosure uh, in clicking on forms is really going to do the trick. I think what Apple's doing is pretty interesting. I mean, they're making it a part of their value proposition that if you go with our products instead of services, we will make certain you know, uh, uh, promises about the way your data will be handled. So I think it's going to be a blend of non-market regulation as well as market-based forces where people try to match, uh, providers match the convenience and flexibility with assurances of privacy that go along with it. And I would uh, I would just add, Jeff, to your point, and I, I think it's a great bifurcation of market and non-market forces at play. You know, um, my title today as a chief digital officer, we didn't actually have uh, anyone in this role before I got here, as an example. And so the point being that that's a new role for most com companies, most enterprises today uh, that has come through in the last five, six, seven years, if you will. Uh, we believe there's going to be a role of a chief ethics officer or a chief digital ethics officer. We believe that corporate enterprises will actually take more ownership of this back to the known market players, if you will. And I think each of us have the responsibility as a board, as a, as a leadership team, to think through the ethics component of how we use the data and make sure we put it foremost. And so, you know, over the years, we've had new titles that have come through. I think a, 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 the next big one is going to be chief, chief ethics officers or chief digital ethics officers happening. And well, I, I also think, oh, oh, go ahead, Sigal, go ahead. Yeah, to add to what Sanjay was uh, saying, I, I think it, it, it's about ML and how um, models are being created, the ethics behind it will be um, really critical and important, not just internal to the company, but they will be scrutinized and there are decisions that are spinning out will be scrutinized as you embed those in your organization. If it is around your hiring practices, if you're using AML or any kind of other decisions that you have to acquiring customers or retaining customers, I think those models that as they become more and more sophisticated, they will become more and more scrutinized. Hmm. Bonnie? Yeah, sure. And I'll add to it, you know, combined with uh, the non-market forces or regulation uh, and internal, the, the values of the company and, and, and honoring the ethics. I also think that the technology itself um, will play a role, a role as well, whether it is, you know, maintaining the privacy within your, within your own um, uh, handheld devices. Uh, and, you know, do we eventually get the breakthrough with distributed led ledger technology or, or call it blockchain where, where there's no central place where your data is stored and it's protected with your own keys? Now, we haven't seen that take off yet, but I do see that might be a path down the, down the way as, uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, Yidner, are you there? Yes, please go ahead. Ask your question. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. We were talking about uh, how technology allow us now to basically work from anywhere. Um, and uh, so one of the questions that came to mind was, how do you guys perceive that the rules for hiring like across countries or even taxes uh, will affect or will change due to all of this? Yeah, it's a great question because there are obviously political trends that run in a different direction. Yep, I, I think we're already seeing in there. We're already seeing uh, states talk about at what point do you have to pay state taxes uh, when, when you spend X number of days working in a certain state or a certain country? Uh, you know, who, who gets rights to those employment taxes? It, it seems to me. And, and when we talk to um, governments, we have a, a, a product called Coursera for government. Governments increasingly are looking at internet connectivity as something like water, electricity, basic healthcare. It's a, it's a basic fundamental need, not only for education, but also for employment. 
so I, I do think it'll be largely left to governments to figure out how to provide two building blocks, connectivity and elementary school level education. Primary and secondary education will be a government service that will be increasingly important to reduce the digital divide. Uh, but, but I think a, another big part of this is just how quickly companies can do their best job to provide the kind of more equitable services on top of that infrastructure. So I think the, the governments are going to have a bigger role to play here. And I'll also add, Yidner, that um, I mean, you bring up an amazingly, it sounds like a simple question, uh, it, the, the answer extremely complex. And I think it is something that governments and companies have, have yet to appreciate um, how complex it is. So, if, you know, we are telling our employees, you you know, if you're in the office, if you're an office worker, you don't have to work in the office, you could work remotely. So, you know, I have team members that are, you know, I have a small team at the moment and there, some of them are working from London and other from Mexico. So if they are working from there, what is the difference if I were to hire someone from there? And yet those distinctions haven't been made yet and how we think through those. Um, but you're right. It's um, I think this is a this is the next step and where the conversations went. I, I don't know where the answers are. Sigal, I, I think it goes yeah. back to what Jeff was saying about we need to define what are we what's the purpose of the office and what do we come to the office for? And and until companies define that, and I'm sure there will be some commonality across um, many companies, I think then that will decide, can somebody work from everywhere, or do you need to be in the office now a certain number of days, or for a certain number of meetings, and will the company facilitate you getting there or getting back home? One, one of the things that I wanted to mention, and Sanjay, you, you might um, be aware of that, is uh, the government of India up until this month did not allow people to work from home, right? Uh, they made an exception during the pandemic, but but uh, the law said that you have to be in an office. And just recently, right, they changed that. So, you know, as Jeff was saying, governments are starting to look at that and that will open a lot of possibilities. I, I, I wonder if- I agree with that. I wonder if I, any of you, I, I, yeah. I was just gonna just gonna uh, add one thing to what Sikal said, which is right on the mark. Which is, listen, and going back to Jeff, the point about governments and tax and and Bonnie, your point, you know, our view is, listen, in the end, the government policies and the tax components will kind of move to adjust to the new normal. The new normal is going to be defined by where is the value can be delivered from, and if that employee, that uh, talent base is available in a certain market that can deliver the best results for what we're looking to do. The reality is the market dynamics will move on the aggregate us into that direction. Okay. And I actually think the government infrastructure, the internet capability, the changing of the telecom rules and other components to be able to make uh, make that happen will become will follow through on the back of that. And so, you know, we get guided by, you know, here's a here's a important piece of work that needs to get done. Where's the te best talent base? What's the best approach to do it? And we use that as a way to sort of think through how to approach problems. But I wonder if any of you have a point of view. I mean, there are still people who believe that, that we are social animals, mm -hmm. that personal contact uh, and interaction encourages innovation. Do any of you on this panel think innovation has been harmed by having a uh, entirely work from home environment? Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, do. I do. You know, I, I think that incremental innovation, a lot of the inertia that you get from projects that have already started, we are still realizing the benefits of projects that were started well before the pandemic. I don't okay. think we yet know what breakthrough innovations we might be sacrificing. And I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know right now are there certain breakthrough innovations that otherwise would have happened if we were in the office that we won't be seeing 12 to 24 months from now? That's that's helpful, Jeff, because a moment ago, I thought you were basically saying that the office would become a place to go and party. Well, you know, so there's a question of, yeah, so there's a question of what is the kind of interaction, digital and, and, and in person, that would be required as elements that would maximize the chance for, and I think mostly breakthrough innovation. I still don't know if it's going to work every single day, but I do think that until VR space, and I do think VR is going to change things. I mean, I've been, I've been playing Beat Saber on Quest, a, uh, on Oculus Quest a lot. It's it's a it's a different world, and it's moving a little bit faster than I think than people think. 
So I, I think it's too soon to know what will be missing and what new technologies might supplement that and what mix of technology and presence will be required. I, I just am not sure yet. You have to figure out how do we innovate remotely because you cannot schedule innovation. You can't say Monday between three and four, we're all going to innovate. We're going to innovate. Week we are not innovating. That, that doesn't work, right? So we'll need to figure out if we are in the hybrid work environment, how do we innovate despite that? And and that's learnings that we still need to do. Right. Yeah, Bonnie. I do think that I do think that we don't end up in a world where all of us are going to work remotely yeah. all the time mm -hmm. for the rest of our lives. I just don't see that scenario possible. And so I do think there's a creative energy component to collaborative teams that come together and come with new I ideas. Know what part, yeah. Look, we've had a little bit of an advantage because we've had the social capital, at least I've had, in my current role of having done this and met with a number of our customers, our suppliers, our employees. And so it's easy to sort of carry through on that. But I, but I worry that in the long run, we're going to need people that to to come together to you know not in foolish ways but in the right ways to, to think this about is, innovation this is really, i'm going to get to you in a minute bonnie but this is a really important conversation and i just want to highlight it because what we have said on this panel is work from home is going to continue in big numbers that work from home may hurt innovation that there's some benefit from people interacting for innovation but that you can't schedule innovation you can't say we're going to have innovation afternoons on wednesday everybody come in and innovate uh, that's an equation that that is clearly uh, uh, by this panel not yet solved. Uh, Bonnie. Yes, but and so I, you know, I think that uh, pulling people together in and, and whether it's yes, it's not scheduled like it's three o'clock today, but it might be that we're going to do a two day session um, and people are going to come together. People need to be able to in structured sessions and in unstructured sessions build and brainstorm. And then you go away and can follow and work those work streams and you come back together again. So it's sort of like flare for all of the ideas and then focus and drill them down, which you can do remotely and then flare again. And so I, I do believe that there are now, where you gather for that, is it still gonna be in the office or might it be somewhere else to stimulate innovation? That, that could be you, an you would prefer people exploration travel. idea. Of uh, course, coming from course. someone from travel. Oh, oh, I, I think you've highlighted a, a critical issue. The other yes, issue that you, <laughs> you all highlighted early on is this whole question of upskilling and preparing people for the jobs of the future, which are coming but in such a rapid uh, pace. And I have a question about that as well, yeah. because it seems to me that higher education just has incredible inertia built around it. <laughs> and this idea that you go off to college for four years and you get your degree and then you're ready to go to work and somebody hires you because of that has really dug in. It's dug in because companies use that four year degree as a credential. It's dug in because the economic models of the colleges is so dependent on it. I wonder if now is the moment that that may start to change and you yes. get more of a lifelong learning using digital uh, tools. And I, I'll, 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 take, I'll take all of your views on yeah, that. Yeah, I'd love to. This one, I, I, you know, obviously, Jeff, you've got a whole business model around it. But I'm, from my world, I, you know, I believe if we were to say that the only place you could learn is if you went to a four year college, that what you're doing then is throwing, throwing away the workforce that is already working because we've just said to this entire conversation that the workplace is fundamentally changing. So the existing workforce, whether you came here with a four year degree or didn't come with a four year degree, your skills are gonna have to fundamentally change the rest of your life. So you have to embed it in the workplace. Now, there still is a place, I do believe, for higher education. And, you know, the Stanford's and Harvard's and everything will continue. But I, I think that some a lot of other colleges will move to full digital. They're having to right now. Um, but more importantly, those, those institutions that evolve into continuous lifelong learning in smaller segments, short snippets, just-in-time learning um, is what is needed. And it will help close the digital divide. And I do believe employers play a role in that. It is not just the employee. I think the employers, there's an imperative behind that. Sanjay, I know you, you at Genpak, you spend a lot of time on this question. I, I Look, I think we think that there's a balance between the two. We do think, and I'm not suggesting all four-year colleges are in this bucket, but we do think there's a role for a fundamental inculcation of the faculty that's important, kind of getting to a baseline where you have you know, a, a foundation upon which 
uh, to take the next step. And then the second half of that, which is the next step, is lifelong learning. learning. And it isn't access just to tools. It's about a sense of humility. It's a sense of curiosity. It's a sense of wanting to learn in the first place. And then once that's in place, being able to pull in. So we think there's a balance. We do think that, that some level of foundational education allows you to get to a, a baseline. And then a lifelong learning is an absolute must in being able to take it. Uh, uh, Jeff, I, I teased you earlier about uh, suggesting that the office in the future was going to be a place to go and party. But I wonder if the same could be said about universities. Well, universities definitely offer a bundled value proposition of learning, a credential at the end, and a residential experience for those who do a residential experience. Those are going to get unbundled. And they're going to be priced uh, appropriately. And there'll be a difference, by the way, between the learning and the credentialing. If you think about Coursera, we've got 4,500 courses that over the last eight years have been created by some of the top universities. By the way, it was more the entrepreneurial professors who did it than the institution as a whole. So it's a little bit of a, 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 an experiment that es escaped from Stanford back in 2012. But now these courses are being used by 76 million learners around the world. 2,400 businesses have hired Coursera to offer our partners courses to their employees to upskill. Uh, over 380 government agencies, now almost 3,700 higher education institutions are actually licensing open content on Coursera from other higher education institutions. So I would, I would not underestimate the rate of digital transformation and actually innovation that we're likely going to see in higher ed in the coming, say, three to five years. Uh, Seagal, you get the last word here. We're just about out of time. Now, I, I ag agree with the panel. I think universities still have their value. Um, and based on the parting that my son is doing, even during Corona, I think um, it's going to continue. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. You've uh, uh, pointed the way to the answers for some problems. You've highlighted some others still, uh, still to be solved, but uh, a great session. And thank you for everyone who participated. And thank you to Impact for hosting the session. We're going to return to the main stage in just a couple of minutes and hope to see everybody back there. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye.